In this episode, I'm once again joined by Dr. K. A. Shakur, spiritual life coach, doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, and author of several books such as Ghetto Sutras and Maha Yoga. Dr. Shakur discusses his own meditation practice, including periods of extreme mantra recitation, and recounts his struggles to reconcile the bodhisattva ideal with corporate culture and for-profit medicine. Dr. Shakur shares his experiences teaching energy and meditation techniques to the mentally ill and discusses the discipline needed to acquire mastery of such techniques. Dr. Shakur also recounts his own encounters with evil, including anecdotes of exorcisms, sorcery, and occult attacks, as well as magical self-defense advice for healers and spiritual practitioners. So without further ado, Dr. K. A. Shakur. Dr. K. A. Shakur, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. And how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fabulously, actually. Very good. And last time we covered, gosh, a lot of your life, actually, from your childhood up to the present day. And, you know, we talked a lot about your spiritual path, uh, your martial arts training, and, you, and indeed also your medical training as a, a doctor of Chinese medicine. And it was a fascinating interview indeed. And today I thought it would be very interesting to talk about some of the various professional situations you found yourself in, in educational institutions, mental health institutions, and your time as a police chaplain. And that, I think, is where the rubber meets the road. But before we go there, I wanted to ask you if there's anything that you wanted to reflect on or anything that had come to your mind between this last episode and our recording today. I could think the only thing I would like to bring up is that um... In my lifetime, I very much was, uh, uh, Islamic Sufism was very much a part of uh, my life. And um, I have studied uh, and been uh, trained in um, actually uh, five uh, Sufi tariqas, uh, completed in, in two, which would be the uh, Tijaniya under Sheikh Ahmed Tijani, who lived in Morocco. And I actually was the first. At least they told me I was the first Westerner to ever visit his tomb uh, in, in the uh, mid-80s uh, in Fez, Morocco. Um, I also um, have been trained in um, Borhania Shazalia, um, Kateria, uh, and also um, Tistia, and also um, the Tariqa, uh, the Muridia of Sheikh Ahmadou Bamba. And um, the interesting thing about that is that uh, the close sheikhs that I studied with told me that ultimately that um, Buddhism would be the path that I would study and that Buddhism and Sufism were very close, even though maybe some people hearing this might have a problem with it. But um, several of my um, teachers uh, told me that. And um, those studying Buddhism from the time I was, I would say, as I said before, around eight, I had to keep a lot of that secret. Uh, because the environment that I lived in, people looked at Buddhism and um, other uh, Vedic type of systems as being polytheism and idol worship, and it's real difficult to explain those types of things. So, I had that I had those Buddhist practices going um, primarily all the time, even though I was uh, outwardly practicing um, Sufism. Because from what my teachers told me, and from what I knew inwardly, it's really that not that much difference other than the outward aspects and the terminology and the rituals, but the core of the teachings are the same. And I might, in my opinion, say that that's true probably for uh, all the systems. Um, if one looks at the actual core of what they, what, they, what they are teaching and expounding. I'm curious, in terms of your Buddhist practice then, you mentioning they're doing Buddhist practices. What have been the main Buddhist practices that you focused on? One thinks, of course, of meditation, shamatha, etc., vipassana, that kind of thing. Deity yoga. I see the uh, you know medicine Buddha behind you in the tanka there. What have been your main practices of a Buddhist nature? Yeah, uh, mantrayana. You know, um, doing um, extreme amount of mantras, um, as well as um, a lot of. Um, I guess, aspects in relationship to what you call Dumo, you know, but lots of mantra, lots of mantra, lots of, lots of mantra work, you know, um, it's been the main aspect, you know, on top of what you just mentioned, or as well as what you just mentioned. So 
that's practice. But then the aspect of working with other people and trying, I guess, that will lead into, I guess, uh, some of the work that I've done or the, the, the attitude in the work that I've done, um, helping relieving suffering and raising consciousness among people. And that's always been my interest um, and heartfelt concern. It, even though my involvement in playing music, that's been the reason putting for a positive message is trying to uh, uplift people and as far as uh, professional work and life in general. So I guess in Buddhism, we would call it bodhisattva, you know. Well, let's transition then, shall we, to your uh, working life. And I mentioned some of the places you've worked, educational institutions, medical, medical, uh, men mental health institutions and law enforcement, etc. Can you give us a sense, perhaps chronologically, of how it was you got into the kind of work that um, I know you've done, and maybe you could then describe uh, some experiences from that time and, and how that bodhisattva ideal that you're following has expressed itself there. Uh, well, you know, I started off, I graduated from undergrad when I was 19, and then I went into the work world, and um, I worked at... Um, Ford Motor Company for several years. I worked as a supervisor there. And um, that was a very interesting experience. Uh, un first of all, uh, understanding the UAW rules, dealing with workers versus management, and seeing how the corporate world worked and, and basically uh, understanding about, I guess if we look at it from a Buddhist point of view, uh, it, the excess of greed uh, it, it, as far as human beings are concerned. And I saw a lot of inhumanity at that time, how women were treated, how workers were treated, and um, how people were treated in general, because the main concern was manufacturing and, and making money uh, and, and meeting deadlines. Um, so the human, the human element uh, really didn't matter. Basically, people were just like numbers, you know. Uh, the assembly lines had to run, and that's all they were concerned about. And so in general, I can say that's what that taught me. It also taught me um, at that time, um, I got, uh, I became a supervisor at uh, Port Motor Company as a result of a class action suit by the federal government. But that was also true that when I went to undergrad school at the University of Michigan Dearborn, um, we, I was a part of the first group of minorities um, that attended that campus at that time. So a lot of experiences I've had were because of uh, class action suits uh, of the fact that institutions were not representative of people of all colors and, and cultures. Um, that being said, being 20 years old or 21 years old, supervising a department of over 70 workers with 50 plus of the workers being white and mostly 50 years or older, and many of them were uh, actually car carrying Ku Klux Klan members and what have you. And to be able to get the cooperation of all those workers to work um, in harmony to the point that our output was three times the amount of what the, uh, the company required. And so that was a great learning experience to the point. The reason why I knew they were car carrying Klan members because they actually told me they were, but that for some reason they said, their experience dealing with me, kind of really not all of them, but changed their view about how they view black folks and how they, you know, those types of things, because I had a harmonious department. So whites and blacks and Arabs began to, um, people from the Middle East began working in the auto industry at that time. Uh, many of them I would allow, you know, when they were able to come in on off days to work in my department. And I treated everybody, I learned, I treated everybody with respect. A lot of times upper management didn't want me to treat everybody with respect. And I remember once they wanted me to fire a guy that was white and I told him, no, I wasn't going to do it. So they pulled me in the back room because it was unjust because he wasn't doing anything against the UAW rules. And I brought to their attention. So they say, I guess they called themselves testing me as far as management. They said, well, why do you care? Because he's white and my uh, immediate supervisor was black. I said, I don't care whether he's white or black or whatever. He's a human being. He didn't do anything wrong. He has a family and I'm not going to do it. So I said, you fire him. And that's when I left the company, you know, because um, I said, you can't guarantee me that if I fire this person, because you said this is a test to for me to evolve up the, the ladder, so to speak. 
I could walk out here and get hit by a car, you know, because I did something unjust to a person. And then I'm in, I, I'm in a hellish state and you can't, you can't do anything in relationship to that. So it's not worth me harming another human being that didn't do anything just because of the potential advancement of me uh, making more money, which I can say at that time in my life, I probably made more money than I ever made in my life, but it just wasn't worth it. And from that, I started working in mental health, which was definitely a, uh, a definite difference in pay, pay grade, but um, it was definitely more fulfilling work. And so I started off as uh, on the lower rung as what you call a child care worker. And um, from that, I worked in different aspects of mental health, um, uh, eventually doing therapy and eventually uh, doing uh, working as a, a social worker and as a counselor and as a therapist. But I did work in different and all the way to the point where I was assistant director of a program. So I did work in various different um, uh, aspects in the mental health field and um, learned a lot. And a lot of it, a lot of the teachings that we are learning in our, in our class right now, um, definitely um, a lot of those things I actually, you know, nasty experienced with um, uh, this, definitely all types of patients um, and personalities that have been uh, classified, DSM classified. So I basically have worked with all those types of personalities. Um, I've worked with people that have been um, victims of serious trauma. I've worked in women's centers. Um, so I've gained more sensitivity of the abuse that women go through. Um, I've been in those environments. I've worked in um, actually co-ed environments. I've worked in uh, addiction uh, centers. Um, I worked in duly diagnosed, uh, um, um, a duly, duly diagnosed uh, ward where I actually ran the ward because the supervisor was ill. And so I would talk to him over the phone, but I was actually doing the actual supervising on the ward. So I'd worked with the doctors, the nurses, and working again with duly diagnosed uh, those persons that had drug addictions as well as mental health classifications. And so those, those experiences were just uh, life changing for me um, to hear the type of stories and the type of suffering that um, persons um, go through and have gone through. And then beyond that, um, having the freedom. Uh, uh, my supervisor's name was the late Robert Perkins and um, he was a great man as far as I'm concerned. He was a, probably a master of what I would say Freudian and young in, young in psychology. Uh, but he gave me the freedom to do a lot of things maybe 30 years ago that we only did a lot of it is, is accepted now and vogue now that wasn't at that time, but he allowed me to uh, institute med meditation in, 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 in the counseling sessions, especially the group sessions. Uh, he allowed me to uh, make some modifications in the diet, especially in the addiction aspects of, 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 of taking a lot of sugar out and bringing in more holistic food and what have you uh, to, and, and re make recommendations on different types of diets um, and what have you. And it began to, um, not everybody, but a lot of people say it was actually working for them and transforming them, uh, especially to fight their addictions. Um, so that was one side of it. Then the other side was management not liking that because they were losing money because their, their beds weren't filled. And they actually be told that don't tell them those things, even though it's true, we don't want them to know that. So that began to, began to open my eyes more and more to the injustices that I call, uh, or the inhumanity of, of the medical network, the, the, the corporate network of medicine. So this is not an indictment against doctors and nurses and, and, and therapists, but the fact that when MBAs and, and bankers and other, other individuals that are concerned about money began to uh, control the medical network, um, these types of things began to happen. And so, I knew right then I didn't want to have anything to do with that system um, anymore. And um, I was fortunate to be able to eventually um, uh, transfer out of that whole situation. Well, I see. Very interesting. I'm curious, uh, at your time at the factory, what you learned about creating a harmonious department at such a young age. You, you said you treated everyone equally or with respect. I'm curious if 
you can go perhaps a bit more deeply into how you pulled that off and, and, and what sort of things you saw other people doing differently uh, that were mistakes? Well, first of all, I guess due to my training or how I was brought up along with my martial training and, 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 and spiritual training, <clears throat> I spoke to people very directly. I was definitely terrified when I first went to the uh, uh, department. So I'm not going to say like, you know, it was definitely a, diff a whole nother world and a whole nother experience. And like I said, I was 20 and 21 years old. So um, uh, dealing with individuals that are 40, 50 and 60 years old, that had worked in that plant. I had no idea of how plants were ran and um, I was totally dependent upon the workers to operate the machine so I had no knowledge of the machines how they worked or anything remember I was put there because they had to put a certain amount of minorities into the plant because of a federal regulation so they just found essentially the the, the plant found blacks that had degrees and just gave us jobs you know to put it like to put it to put it very frankly to you so anyway what I said to them was this. I said, most of you gentlemen are old enough to be my father or grandfather, so I'm not coming here to boss you. Um, I called a group, a, a, a company or department meeting. I said, I have several rules. These rules are no drinking and getting high in my department, no sex in my department, um, no sleeping in my department. But if you want to punch your friend in and somebody wants to sleep out in the, in the, in the parking lot and you want to do your buddy's work and y'all want to go back and forth on that. I don't care about that. The only thing I care is that I get 10,000 side gears at the end of the night, because that was the quota that we were expected. Other than that, if you can follow these rules, we have no problem. As a result, I was getting 30,000 side gears a night to where upper management wanted to know what is it that I was doing that the other departments weren't doing other than that. And also, the plant ran on three shifts. The other shifts were getting like less than 10,000 a night. And, they, and all of a sudden my shift was getting 30,000. So they couldn't understand what was going on. And a lot of it had to do with treating and talking to people with respect is really just that simple because upper management really at the, especially at that time were very verbally abusive towards workers, had a very condescending view towards workers and even more condescending view towards women. And I didn't have those I, I, my, my my attitude wasn't like that. I treat everybody with respect and everybody fairly. And I made made true all my promises and the workers respected that. So I didn't never had any problem. I just didn't have any problem. So much so is that when the workers had a party once, um, the UAW people invited me to the party because they said that I was one of the two management people that actually they actually liked. But I was fair, but I followed the rules that according to the UAW rules versus the company rules. So it was always, always uh, uh, back and forth that went on with that. But um, basically, we didn't have problems there because of that. It's really just that simple. It wasn't, it's really no, uh, it didn't really take rocket science. It's, it's just talking to people and being straight, being straight up with them and treating people with respect. Just because I was their supervisor, I, I, that didn't make me better than them. And that definitely didn't give me a right to uh, 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 speak condescendingly or have an attitude that I'm better than you are. And I think they felt that. Very interesting indeed. And what about the uh, mental health institutions that you're a part of? Famously, I think these sorts of places are known for institutional, um, well, the word I want to use is, want to use is constipation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which impedes the effective treatment uh, it ties the hands of the of the nurses and doctors, as well as, uh, of course, lowers the quality of care. Um, did, how did you navigate the institutional side of mental health institution? Well, it, it was very difficult, to be honest with you, because first of all, it took a long time or a certain amount of time to understand how the system really worked. So you hear I'm speaking today, but at the time, you know, you still had, uh, I still didn't have knowledge of, you know, the whole, how the whole system worked from the money end of it. You know, you go in and you're, you're concerned about helping the client. But what happens is your hands get tied because you end up doing 70 percent of your job becomes just doing paperwork and only 30 percent you actually working with the client. But then as my supervisors would tell me is that the paperwork was most important because they're concerned about the funding agency. So it was like funding agencies. So it was always this game. And, you know, so when I look back on it now or when I 
began to realize that there was only so much money that was put into these situations. And so therefore you end up, it ends up becoming um, like a game. So if a person actually ends up reaching a state of wellness is almost just by chance that that happens. Uh, that the actual aspect is maybe you have a small percentage of success stories so they can show that at the end of the year to the funding agencies, but actually it becomes a, a money-making situation. So it's not really totally designed to really help patients get well because there's a lot of money involved. So they're really not trying to like really help everybody. Now, what happened was um, I worked at one agency and I became so frustrated um, with doing all this paperwork all the time. And I wasn't the only person who felt like that. I said, you know, I'm gonna write a, a, a pilot program, which I felt it would never be, they would never do it. Uh, the, the, the director of the center, uh, the late Orlando, Orlando Shorey, um, actually said, we're gonna try it as a pilot program. And that pilot program was to teach yoga, Aikido and Tai Chi. Um, I was working in a, a, in a, um, in a day treatment program dealing with uh, adolescents that were uh, classified as learning disabled and emotionally impaired. <clears throat> so there were many, we worked on treatment teams working with these youth. So we had a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, um, several teachers, social workers, all working in a treatment team, working with various patients. And basically uh, at the social worker one level that I was, we were doing all the work out of the DSM. Basically the, the psychiatrist would sign off on paperwork but we were actually doing actual therapy. So um, I got a lot of, lot of training uh, in, in that area. And, um, but again, it was frustrating. We were doing like, uh, I was doing like maybe six to eight individual um, counseling sessions a day, as well as two group counseling sessions. Uh, but it, it, it did, I didn't see any progress. And I was concerned about the progress of the, of the clients. It wasn't just a job where I just want to just go to work get my check and that's it. So I wrote this program up, um, again, dealing with internal energetic practices. And uh, Mr. Shorey said, yes, we're going to do it. I was totally amazed. And that's where the transition began to take place for me uh, because um, half of the day I was able to teach yoga, Tai Chi, and Aikido um, to a selected group of students that they chose. Uh, and they did that as an experiment for um, six months to the six months program turned out to be an overwhelming success. Um, and I have documentation on this, uh, according to the psychiatrist and the medical team, the treatment teams there, the way they kept it going as long as I continued to work there. That began to turn my life or my thinking that this is the direction that I want to go in more so. And I want to transition out of this uh, other type of um, uh, situation. And eventually I did. I did go over to, again to, to my next work experience, major work experience was at the hospital working in a duly diagnosed ward. And then from there, I went into strictly um, uh, teaching the energetic arts in, um, in, in schools. Um, I wrote up programs because it wasn't popular at that time. So I wrote up my own programs and began to teach in community colleges in the area as well as uh, local high schools. How do you see the interaction of the energy practices that you were teaching and the mental health challenges that your clients were facing in those situations. Uh, what did you learn about that interaction? Some people say that these sorts of inner practices are something of a panacea, a cure-all for any uh, inner ailment. Others say that those sorts of inner practices can exacerbate and make much worse imbalances uh, of the mind or of the of the spirit etc of emotions and so on what was your uh, experience when you started to bring these kind of practices which can be quite powerful indeed into that sort of a context i can honestly say that the experiences were all positive um, but let me say this um, if you're going to institute energetic practices first it's very important that the person that's doing it actually have practices, don't have done those practices themselves for a long time and actually understand them. That's very important. And so going to a seminar, I mean, in the world that we live today versus I think I talked about in the first talk um, in the time that I came through, I studied with teachers privately 
And not only that, teachers were very, very hard and thorough because energetic uh, 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 practices weren't money-making uh, institutions like the way uh, 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 it is today. So when teachers first came into America, or first came into the areas I was in, they would have a small group of students and they would just actually teach you, like I would say, old style. And, you know, today we live in the seminar world, a lot of money involved in teaching yoga and energetic practices. You have all kinds of people saying they're teaching it. Some people are qualified, some people are maybe less qualified, and some people might not even be qualified at all. But because of business, they can do things and they have nice websites and they can talk nice language. But talking nice language and actually knowing what you're doing are two different things. Of course, we do have to be able to communicate, don't get me wrong, but a lot of people have a good talk game, but they really don't have real knowledge of, of energetic practices because it takes years of practice uh, to even get certain levels of, uh, of attainment. So in my case, my students, my teachers actually came to my classes when they gave me permission to teach. So I never went out and taught on my own because I did what I want to do. Actually, I didn't want to do it. They told me I had to do it. Okay, so out of respect for them is why I began to start doing it. That's A. And B, they came and looked at my classes. And then, and they corrected me. And then they eventually said, wrote me letters and what have you, letters of recommendation. Say, yeah, you now you have uh, full, you have, we give you full permission to be able to go teach whatever those particular disciplines were, which I think in today's world, sometimes is a little bit different. You know, you have people that, have money and they take seminars they go someplace for a few while a little bit and they all of a sudden want to come back and mix in some teachings with they might be a psychologist or a social worker or whatever they might be and they go to the east or they take you know they go to india or nepal or tibet or they study seminars and they want to mix in some techniques with what they have and they really don't know how it works now i'm not saying everybody does that but there are a lot of people that are doing that in my view so the first thing, you have to really know what you're practicing. You've had to practice it yourself and go through the trials and tribulations with those practices because practices, you know, you have what you call the honeymoon periods, almost like a relationship. You have honeymoon periods with practices. Then you go through times with the practices that you, you don't even know why you're doing it. They irritate you. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, but you still have to keep doing it. And then, then all of a sudden, certain things begin to happen after, time, after so much time of practice. So that becomes number one. And so I'm saying all this to lead into me and what I was doing. Then I had to understand the Western practices I was doing. And then beyond that, I had to understand my, the patients and clients I was working with. And so, and so understanding that, you began to use maybe little, you give people little things to, to practice that are, are quote unquote safe. And then you look to see what the response is. And you have to, you, you, a person can't, give techniques to a patient and you not really spend a lot of time with them because I was in a day treatment program. I saw those same clients every day. So, but if I was going to see somebody once a week, I'm not going to give them some type of practice and then they go and they have some type of discharge or some type of breakthrough psychologically. I'm not there. And then they can have some type of breakdown. I think that's some of the things we were talking a few weeks ago in class. So a person has to be able to use discernment when it comes to those things, because I was around those clients every day, uh, primarily five days a week. Um, and then when I was in the hospital, I was there seven days a week. So if I gave something for somebody to do, if something happened, I was right there the next day to, to see what happened, which, it, you know, if they did have, because, you know, if you give people certain things, especially even this shamatha, if you began to sit there, the first thing that's going to happen with people to have a lot of guilt, especially in substance abuse that have been abused or have done things themselves, all, that's, all that guilt is going to come up. That, that all that guilt's going to come up. So what happens in that case? Sometimes a person feels so uh, uh, helpless, they want to kill themselves or they feel by suicide. They feel suicide because all those aspects come up. Now, even in traditional practice, when in, in the old days, when people were studying with gurus and lamas, though, they would be right there with their teacher. Those things came up with them, too. It's just that when we read the books, they write it in a, in, in a real, uh, 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 you know, romantic type of way, you know. But I remember reading about Yessi uh, Sogo, that when she went through certain aspects and 
uh, if I remember, she had certain kind of um, uh, 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 mental outbreaks and what have you. And Guru Rinpoche had to show up a couple of times and, and, and you know, and calm her down, just putting it in, in mild terms. So it's not like, so a lot of times we have romantic views about these these yogis and different people we read about and stuff, they were human beings just like us. They went through stuff when they were going through those retreats and stuff. They went through things too, just like what we go through. It's just they don't explain it like that when we read the books. It's all written in real uh, uh, romantic type of language. And so therefore, a lot of times a person gets the wrong understanding that all I got to do is do this breathing exercise or do this mantra or do this practice and instant, pra instant presto, I'm I'm enlightened and instant presto, everything goes away. It don't just work. It don't work like that. But that comes from not having proper teachings and proper understanding about what it is. That's my, that would be my opinion about it and what I've seen. So having teachers that talk to me very direct like that, and that I guess that's the difference and, and have the, the, the motivation of the teacher or when you have one-on-one -on -one relationships or small group relationships, the teachers, uh, the teachers I have talk very direct, so they didn't talk all that romantic type of thing. And I, that's sort of like why I like Dr. Nita, because he's very direct. It's not a whole lot of romanticism and fantasy, uh, because it's not that. Even though there's great things to come from the practices, but there are also other aspects to come through to, with it also. You said a few interesting things there about the path of practice, the honeymoon period, and then a dry kind of a desert period uh, where even just you wonder why you're doing the practice and it's kind of irritating in a way. And then somehow, for some reason, if you persist, then you break through into something else. So I'm wondering if you might, as I re reflect that back to you, do you think, can you think of any of your own practices, any times in your own practice, uh, challenges you faced? I'm thinking also of, uh, you know, some of these practices, energetic practices, meditation practices and so on they suggest that your past karma comes out or traumas or uh, some practices even say from past life and there, there can be purification periods, difficult periods, desert periods, to use a more Christian analogy there. Have you had periods like that in your practice? And uh, um, um, if so, what was that like? Can you tell that story? And um, what was the first that came afterwards? Well, I can say this. First of all, my first teacher was my mother. You know, my mother said that all problems in life are solved through prayer and meditation from the time I can remember myself. She always said that no matter what happens. And my mother lost all her siblings and lost my sister and just two husbands and friends and what have you. She lived to be 102. Um, so naturally, she lost a lot of people. And I never saw my mother um, drink. I never saw her go to no therapist or have no nervous breakdown. And I wonder, she's like the strongest, especially dealing with death and, you know, she said, prayer and meditation is the key. So seeing that, that was like really my first teacher in imprint, you know, before we even talk about any other type of teachings and teachers. And so that always stayed with me. So no matter what happened in my life and what I did, I always did my mantras and always did my prayers, regardless of what was going on, no matter how bad I felt. And I'm telling you, uh, when my son, um, I did lose a son, um, if I ever came close to wanting to give up, and I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. I almost came right on the edge of saying, I can't, I, I give up. But, you know, I pushed through. That was as close as I got to it. But I did my prayers um, and my meditations every day. What happens with a lot of people is sensations. You know, when we first start doing practices, we have different types of sensations, dreams, visions, different stuff happens. And then you go through this period where nothing don't happen. You know, and what happens, is, especially Westerners, I can't speak for people in other parts of the world, um, because of the environment we live in, we definitely like sensation. You know, we want to have experience. Wow, I saw this. Wow, this happened. Wow, that, you know. So when that goes away and you're going through the, the, the trials and tribulations of life, it's like, why in the heck am I doing this every day? I might as well just get this up. You understand? Because ain't nothing happening because we want these, this immediate gratification, you know. I was saying my case, because I was, from the time I was a child, I was told no matter what happens, you keep doing this. And actually the teachers I had always would reinforce that no matter what I experienced, no matter how devastating uh, of life experiences that I've experienced, I always kept my practices going, whether I felt anything or not, whether I thought something was happening or not, I still did it every day. 
And, you know, because sometimes you're going to, you, you, you're just doing it and you don't, you, for the lack of language, you don't feel anything or you don't think anything is happening. But, you, you know, you get to the place, you're not doing it because you want something to happen. You're doing it for the love of doing it. So I'm not looking for something to happen. You know, do I mention different things sometimes to people? Yeah, sometimes I mention different things as a form of encouragement to folks like, you know, well, if I experience this and I'm just a regular old guy, you can experience the same thing. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so sometimes I have mentioned super normal experiences and stuff like that, but not. But for the sake, sake of a med, uh, uh, as a form of motivation, so sometimes I've mentioned those things to certain people. But most people, that's usually the issue <clears throat> with most things, <clears throat> is the honeymoon period, and then once that, you know, goes away, the the rigors of having that's true with a lot of things. You get a job, you like it the first three or four months, and all of a sudden, you know, that newness goes away, and then it's like, oh, I got to go to work today. Same thing happened in relationship. Same thing, same thing happens with a lot of things, unless you really have a heart motivation towards it to keep practicing and keep or keep with it, whatever it might be. What do you think is the difference between the kind of people that keep on going and those that look to the next novelty? I think it's a part of culture. I mean, that's the one way I can explain it. I think I sort of like talked about it, like in Western culture, which I can speak about most. A lot of things are based on it, especially in modern Western culture, based on sensation, based on immediate gratification, because we live in a society that's based on productivity and making money. What's the next big thing? You know, so you get a cell phone. The next year is the new improving cell phone. Then the next year is the new improved other cell phones. So you people, I got to have this one. I got to have that. The same thing with clothes, the same thing with computers and cars and music and, you know, all those types of things. Always what's the next thing? Wherein I can even go back maybe 40 years ago, my mother bought a, a, a stereo system in 1949 and a Magnavox, and it still works like a charm today because the, the society and, and, and the world we lived in at that time was different, you know, entirely different. The economic structure and everything was totally different. Now we live in a throwaway society. So I think that that's what happened with the mentality. People want immediate gratification. They don't have, they have very little concept about follow through or sticking with something. And I can say that even with teaching, teaching students today and in, in the way in which you have to design teaching methods versus teaching methods 20 years ago. There are things that I did 20 years ago I would never even think about doing today because uh, the mentality of most people can't even tolerate. They couldn't tolerate it or wouldn't do it. So therefore, you still want to keep the quality, but you have to be creative enough to be able to design a teaching so that a person can comprehend, comprehend it. So what I find is I have to break down teachings even, even to its lowest common denominator and give people teachings in, in, in smaller increments because they're not able to take a lot today. That's what I see for most people. Hmm. Is this the way our society is? What kind of teaching methods did you use that you wouldn't use today? What were you thinking of? Oh, well, I remember back in the day, um, we called ourselves doing Dumo. So I lived up in, um, in, in Michigan where it would be cold. So we, I, I would take a few students out and we would, um, uh, well, we, we would go out in the cold and do breathing exercises, you know, with our, bare, you know, with our tops off, for example. I would never do that today. I wouldn't even introduce anything like that today. And I only did that with a few students, but I wouldn't do that at all, period. Why not? Okay, Why something not? like that or training outside because going through medical school have taught me a lot too. So naturally training in too much cold or too much heat can damage chi or lung as we call it in Tibetan or prana, you know? So those are special techniques where it takes a lot of training and it takes a lot of time. And what I've learned about Dumo, uh, which a lot of people like to practice, uh, uh, you know, Dumo is good to, to raise the heat. You can get the heat through other things, but we not live in 12,000 feet above sea level either in that environment. So uh, some of those practices to that extreme was necessary for the environment. When you live in an urban city or at, at, at sea level, 
some of those practices are just not practical to do. That those type of things sometimes can lead to mental imbalance because you have to know the wisdom of, you know, I'm not Miller Ripper and I'm not living, like I say, 12 to 14,000 feet above sea level, but people read a lot of these things. Or the same thing with being, uh, 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 going without eating. I'm just going to be a, be a breathitarian and, and all types of other type of extreme practices that people read about but it doesn't work for the environment that you live in. So understanding the terrain and the environment is very important based on the practices you do. So you just can't read books and read about individuals and say, hey, I'm gonna do this. And I've had students that actually were on the verge of being ill and I had to refer them to a doctor or refer them to an acupuncturist. And I had to correct them about certain things because they were reading books about what yogis did in, in, in uh, medieval India, in Tibet and Nepal and those places. You can't do that. We're in a different time period. We're in a different area. We're in, uh, they didn't have to deal with smog. They didn't have to deal with automobiles and, and stoplights. And there's all types of things that we live in. So the practices have to be somewhat uh, uh, geared towards the environment that you're in. Th those are some of the things that I've seen. Mm -hmm. And th th those are some of the realizations I've come to. You know, uh, you mentioned there a little earlier, supernormal experiences. And something I've heard you talk about before, I wondered if you might talk a little about that. And I don't know if this perhaps leads into your work as a police chaplain. You've said that you've encountered in your work uh, practitioners of, shall we say, malicious kind, magic, uh, things of that nature. That's something that you've run up against. I'm curious if you might talk about what sort of context you've run up against those kind of things. I, I think it's uh, something to do with your work as a police chaplain, perhaps not. Well, being a police chaplain helped me understand more about, for the lack of a better term, um, so I don't, you know, I don't want to sound too preachy and, and, and what have you, but it, 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 lack of a better term, helped me understand about what we would consider evil. And um, I saw a lot. I saw a lot, you know, I was able to, you know, a lot of murder scenes going to, I've seen a lot of murder scenes. It's like this, you know, um, in religion and spirituality, people talk about evil, fighting against evil. You got to, you know, this, that, and the other. And so I began to ask myself, well, what is evil? How does it look? What's the nature of it? You know? And so I began to do a study academically as rather, and rather practically on understanding about evil you know, and why human beings um, do the kind of things they do to other folks. And naturally, I would say um, the end result, I would say, would have to do with the glaciers as we speak about in Buddhism, you know, or in Christianity, they talk about the seven, seven deadly sins. In Islam, they use the word lower nafs or lower aspects of the human being. But in the more practical sense, first, I'll say that there are a lot of people practicing uh, sorcery. A lot of negative sorcery is being done, period, um, even as we speak right now. Uh, and many of the patients and clients that I've come in contact with, um, when I really get, when we really get down to it, they're usually victims of these types of things and or uh, victims of molestation and abuse, which breaks down the psychic wall a lot of times. They call that causes other intelligences to take over that person, um, especially when young children are uh, molested in many cases. So uh, in, in, my, in my experiences talking with people because they feel comfortable, I guess at a certain point, they will begin to express that, you know, there's an entity that talks to them or these types of things. So th th this, this becomes commonplace. With, it's been, been commonplace with me again a lot of it is rooted in molestation which is something that uh we don't talk about a lot it's talked about but it's still not talked about a lot uh, from i would say almost 80 to 90 percent of cases that i've ever talked with uh clients that i've talked with in all categories whether it's police chaplaincy private practice in in the clinic of acupuncture or dealing in mental health substance abuse Molestation is usually the number, the number one root cause. Not in all cases, but usually in most cases. And it's still, again, something that's covered up. And so when you look at the root, when I look at the root of a lot of things, that's some of it. And then 
a lot of another thing has to do with Clacious greed um, and naturally people having low concepts of themselves and the fact that sorcery works if you know how to use it. Uh, matter of fact, you don't have to, you could, you can be a five, uh, you can read at a fourth grade or fifth grade level and pick up some book on magic and crack one, use one of the spells in there and it'll work, but it'll take an expert to try to take it off of a person. So, and a lot of these books are available at bookstores all over America. You know, all types of uh, uh, books to put spells on folks. And actually, a lot of it deals with relationships. And then some of it deals with getting money. And a lot of it deals with revenge. And these are lower uh, uh, emotions that human beings have. You know, so it's been around since the beginning of recorded history, uh, these types of practices. But it's become very vogue in our society because it's not illegal in our society. So you can't go into no courtroom saying somebody used sorcery against me else they would probably send you to a psychiatrist so you can't use any of that but people are doing it all the time in all walks of life they're doing it and i've had so many people come to me and reveal the fact that they were doing these things um and admitted that they were doing it so um that's what i have to say about that but yeah i've, I've done a lot of study i've studied with people or talk with people that actually practice these things they were actually experts in what you call um these types of practices. So I wanted to get an academic understanding of it. I never practiced those things myself, but I wanted to get an academic understanding of how it worked, how people used it and what have you. So it's almost like on a medical end, when a patient or a client comes in, there's been a victim of those types of things, knowing what it is and then knowing the proper remedy. So it's not as easy as what people think. There's a, there's a lot that goes along with this type of situation because there are cultural aspects that are involved too. So there's different types of sorcery that is used depending on uh, what culture it comes from. So you have to have some knowledge of those things. And then to be able to counteract it, um, you have to be familiar with prayers and rituals of different traditions, not just one tradition because one tradition don't work for everything. That's what I found. So if I'm dealing with somebody that's been victimized, uh, that comes out of a Christian tradition, if I start using uh, Sanskrit and, and mantras, it don't work. You know, I have to use something else. And a lot of that has to do with a person's mind is connected to. So, that, so that's one thing that I found out that's going into chaplaincy too. Uh, we were trained that we had to minister to all police so therefore we had to be familiar with all the major religions and all the major customs so even though i might be a one particular faith if a police officer uh needed the chaplains uh, uh needed our services i had to use the scriptures or use the language that they were familiar with and so that's what i've learned in general with with healing it, you know i could be a buddhist but i use I familiarize myself enough with enough of the major rituals and prayers that those are the things that I use um, with, with the person I'm dealing with. Now, what really turned my mind in that direction was a Lama by the name Chaldo uh, Tuku Rinpoche, who passed away, what, 19, uh, 2005, I think, in Brazil. He was a Nima Lama, but I had the opportunity, I think I might even mention it in the previous uh, broadcast, of meeting him, and I remember at that time, because I was practicing some other types of work, he said, whatever energetic practices you do, this is what you do in order to heal, because I had taken a person there that had a, a certain ailment. And so that opened my mind up that, that you know, when you're doing healing, you use, you use the instruments, uh, especially spiritual instruments that your patient is familiar with, not what you want them to do. You know, so I usually find that out from a person. What's your background? What's your belief system? What do you believe in? Some people don't, are atheistic or agnostic. So therefore, I give them uh, maybe some scientific type of ways of doing things uh, that are based on prayers and what have you, because they don't believe in that. So it's all in what's in the person's mind. So you have to give a person something that's in their mind that they feel connected to. And that's when the healing begins to get begin to happen on that particular level when you're dealing with spiritual uh, a healing exorcisms and things of this nature um, it requires that but that requires a lot of study and training and insight it's not something 
is not what people think it is. It's, you know, it's not what people think it is. Our people think of this rom romanticism because they see stuff in the movies that you can just do some prayer and, and the entity just leaves out instantly and that's the end of it. It, it don't, it, it's nothing like that. And if you don't know what you're doing, sometimes those same entities can attack you and damage you and your family. So you have to have, you have to know what you're dealing with. It takes years and years of training. It's not, it's not no, it's not no instant presto thing that you can learn. You have to really take a lot of time studying and I'm still studying and I've been, I, I've been doing this for at least 30 years. Not because I say, well, hey, I want to be an exorcist. Hey, I was, it didn't happen like that. Actually, what happened was this. And I can't remember if I mentioned in the last broadcast, I was in the hospital and a patient came in and asked me to exercise them. And I told them I, I was a therapist. I don't do exorcism. And the, the, patient, <clears throat> the patient kept worrying me. They kept saying they wanted me to do this. And I told them I couldn't do it. <clears throat> they said, yes, you can. I need you to do this. And so we just kept going back and forth. And so finally, there was a Bible that happened to be in my office, and I didn't know what I was doing. I said, okay, look, I'm going to take this Bible. I don't know what I'm doing. I told the patient that since you asked me to do this, I'm going to do it because you asked me to do it. And so I, I made that clear. So I don't know what's going to happen because I've never done anything like this before. So I took the Bible. I think I had him hold it or I put it on his head or whatever I did, and I just made up a prayer in my head. And um, lo and behold, I had these French windows in my office. The windows blew open and this black entity just came out the person. I was totally amazed and shocked. And that's sort of like what got me going. And I talked to several of my teachers about it and they said, well, yeah, you're supposed to be, you know, evidently this is something you're supposed to be doing. So then that kind of really opened my eyes towards uh, uh, or motivated me towards really studying academically as well as really going deep and deep into this particular situation and because so many people were telling me they were victims of these things you know um, I've, I've worked with murderers before I've worked with serial killers before and really talking with them some in the hospital and some as a police chaplain talking with them they would say voices and then and would tell them to do certain things sometimes they would do things they had no memory that they did it after it happened and I really believed them they say an entity would come and talk to me and tell me do this and do that. I said, well, describe this entity, what it looked like. They start describing things. And then I would hear other people give similar stories. So then I began to hear, see a, a commonality in the stories that I was hearing. Um, it had nothing to do with race. It had nothing to do with gender. It had nothing to do with age. A lot of these stories were becoming similar and the patterns were becoming similar. So then I began to see certain things and then academically reading about various forms of sorcery and how it was being used and, and accounts and what have you, I began to see a, a, a certain type of uh, pattern. You know, everything's not 100%, but I began to see a lot of patterns. You know, but it's real delicate. Everyone that says they're possessed is not possessed. A lot of times people just have psychological and chemical imbalances. You have to be able to know the difference. You know, sometimes it's both, you know, so sometimes it takes a group of people to work with an individual. You know, it takes dietary change, all the things that we're learning. It takes dietary change. It takes a, a treatment team. Sometimes it takes a doctor as well as a spiritualist, as well as a number of people. And then I give the person things to do. So a mistake that a lot of people make is they, they, that I can do this by my, you can't do it by it. So you, the person has to buy in on a certain level. Because many people I've talked to say, well, I didn't want to let the thing go because it's been with me so long. I didn't want to let it go. So even though you did this and it went away, I called it back. So the individual that you're working with has to buy in and do a certain amount of things on their own. That's what I find that has worked. But to say, I'm going to do all this myself and I'm coming in and I'm going to just do all this stuff and everything's going to happen. Um, Sometimes it's like that. Most of the time it's not. Most of the time, it's not. The person has to buy into it. Same thing with treatment. The patient has to buy into the treatment. They have to, they have to be uh, a part uh, of the treatment themselves. If they're fighting you or don't want to do the work, then only a certain amount of, if anything, is going to happen. I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does. What kind of patterns did you observe in the descriptions of uh, the, your clients? And also, I'm curious if anyone ever came after you 
in an occult way using sorcery for example oh yeah definitely definitely i mean my son that passed away was a result of that and i got a call on the phone from people that did it and said that was intended for you but because you had spiritual protection up we hit your son instead so and i've had people come to me and admitted to me that they were doing things against me i was in a relationship once and the woman got very very sick years later some people came to me and said I, we want to apologize we, we were praying against you and as well as other people every week, you understand, and um, and what have you. So I've been fortunate in the respects that I've had actual people admit to me they were doing things, you know. So that being said, um, it's a, um, you, <clears throat> I put it like this, you have, your mind's eye have to be open to see what it is because normally when sorcery takes place, it can be explained in logical terms so that's why a lot of times most people don't believe if you say oh that's sorcery they don't believe it because you say well the person just slipped on a banana peel you understand how does that have to do with sorcery they just weren't paying attention and slipped on the back of the banana peel and hit their head you know and so if you say oh no it was sorcery it was this the person look at you like something's wrong with you so most people don't see it as that only if you're sensitive enough to see it or your mind's eye can see it, that's fine. If not, you have to be able to explain it in other ways. So like being a police chaplain, a lot of times I saw certain things take place, but I had to give the description in, in regular terms, not in those type of terms, because I knew it wouldn't be accepted. But I knew that it was more to it involved. And a lot of times when something happens, is it, it, it everything is in place you know so there's a physical cause as well as a spiritual cause but it's just like most people deal with evidence-based like in western medicine it's evidence-based where in our medicine is is the mind level the energy level a, and the physical level so when people they really know what they're doing practicing sorcery is it is addressed all three of those categories so you get in your car and somebody run into you but I've had people run into me <clears throat> and the person say, I don't know what happened. Something took over me and I ran into you. I've been at accidents where people say, I don't know what happened. And they weren't on medication. They weren't on drugs. They said something took over my, my steering wheel and then I couldn't control it anymore. I've had people say those things. And the police, the police would look at them and like, these people are crazy, but I already knew what was going on, but I couldn't say anything. So I do know that these things happen. That's not all the time, but it happens many times. Why have people come after you then, particularly? What? Well, I mean, it's like anything else. If you're trying to, if you're on the path, path where I put it this way, if you're on the path of being a healer, there are other people that are on the path for, uh, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, you, you can affect, there are people on the other end that make money. This is like I've had clients that were big-time drug dealers. They say, well, we prayed to entities for people to die. The reason why I was a Satanist or the reason why I worked on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the negative end is because it, it, helped my, it, helped, it helped my business and what we're trying to do. So a healer might be on one end trying to heal people, but there are other people that might be losing money because you're healing them. Drug dealers don't want to see people not be drug dealers. Uh, drug addicted you know what i'm saying so if you helping people to get off drugs you working against the pe people that are trying to make that, that they're trying to keep it going it's just like that it, it's really it's really not no rocket science there's there, you know life is like a coin to me you have heads and tails so wherever heads goes tails go so if you evolve the more you evolve spiritually the more the challenges of negativity happen whether it's within your own being or whether it's projected outwardly, you know, um, and we, 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 can, we can read the lives of the various lamas that we read about, Guru Rinpoche, Miller Ripa, you know, all of them, they all had challenges of, of various types, um, whether it was in a society and definitely lots of sorcery that was being practiced, you know. That's just how it is. And we read the life of, of Jesus and the disciples and, and the exorcisms they were doing, uh, taking spirits out of people. So, I mean, that's just the way of this life. That's how I look at it. 
so the work that I'm doing and working with other people to try to um, transform the environment that we're in with the, uh, the literacy problems here and the drug issues and the murder issues. Um, on one end, as I've been told, you know, it affects the people in the prison. Uh, uh, so they say we're trying to make more prisons. So we start getting people meditating and off drugs and stuff, we losing money. It's just that simple. And I think that's why I'm saying this, not just for myself, but I'm saying that for younger people out here and other folks that are on the path of being healers, um, you have to be aware of that, you know, there's there's that other aspect that you're dealing with. And when you make somebody feel, when you heal somebody or you assist the person in healing, somebody else on the other end is, is losing profits on some kind of level. And when I think of... Uh... To quote Dion Fortune's uh, phrase, psychic self-defense, you know, uh, yes. some, some people say uh, the best defense is a kind of uh, ignore or rise above or that don't give it any energy. Other people, of course, say, no, you've got to take more active measures, the preventative or indeed in response to certain uh, things. For example, in Dion Fortune's book, she has that idea of, which is a famous uh, occult book on the subject of psychic self-defense, you know, the idea of uh, imagining uh, energy shield around you, etc. And of course, all of the, uh, many of the uh, tantric Buddhist satanists and so on involve some uh, systems, rather, involve protection, whether it, whether it's metaphorical or not, is up to the individual, I suppose, to interpret. But most systems have some sort of... Uh, at least gesture towards protection or some sort or deliver us from evil, that sort of thing. So what's your take on that? Uh, what's your advice or what have you done and actually and, and found to be successful personally? And what's your advice for others in terms of this area of, should we say, psychic or occult self-defense? Well, first of all, a person has to do what they feel <clears throat> works for them. So there's no one thing that works. That's the first thing. That's A. B, as above, so below. So I guess most people lock the doors to their house. Most people have a special code on their computers and, and phones, and definitely they have a special code on their bank accounts and credit cards and all those types of things. Most people, I would assume, do that, and they lock the doors to their car. And some people even have alarms on their car. That's on the physical level. Some people, like in the United States, um, Second Amendment rights, they even carry a concealed weapon on the physical plane. So why are they doing all that? You know what I'm saying? Because people carjack, people steal, people rob, people do all these things. So <clears throat> just saying, I'm going to have a positive view on life, in my opinion, is not enough because we do have intelligence and there are certain things that go on around us. But again, everybody has to do what works for them. Some people, because of their personalities and how they are, they can have that attitude and, and they're fine. That's one thing. Now, the next thing is, it depends on what you're doing. If a person is a housewife or stays at home or retired, maybe they all this kind of stuff they don't need, they don't need because they how their life is. But maybe if you're doing some other kind of work, you understand, then these, these other type of methods are necessary because, again, you're affecting an equal and opposite type of uh, 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 energy. You understand what I'm saying? So... That's what I would say to that. And then personally with myself, um, I've learned a, a variety of, of, of self-defense systems from physical, um, uh, what you call martial arts of mind-body practices, which I've been, which I think we talked about that in the first uh, talk, uh, to what you want to say, psychic forms of um, defense and, and what have you, of, of many types, you know, so... Um, without saying what they are, I have a whole arsenal of stuff. And I know how to use them. Fortunately, at this point, I know how, I do know how to use them. And as far as the Tibetan Buddhist uh, pantheon, I probably have at my disposal most of the stuff that is used in that particular system. But I have other things too. But they, you know, you have to know when to use it and you have to use discernment. It's not because you have that stuff, you just 
use it. There's a trust that's involved. And I remember studying with certain teachers. They would give you certain things and just to see whether you would use it or not. They say a lot of times they would give you stuff as a test to see whether you would use it or not use it. And most of the time it's not, it's about not using it. It's like martial arts. You know, I know what I can do, but I avoid trouble completely and don't want to get into no kind of, no kind of altercation with nobody, you know? So it's a mental trust, you know? And when teachers give you certain type of things, they give them to you. Um, your mind has to be stable to it. You have to go through certain training in order to get certain stuff. Unfortunately, we live in a society today that we have the internet, we have Google, so people can Google and get all kinds of stuff, you understand, and, and they do it, and really they hurt themselves doing it because they don't know what they're doing. They don't realize the, the side effect of, of doing certain things. There's side effects. To, that's another thing. It's like a, like a 50 cal gun. You shoot it, or certain shotguns, there's recoil on it. Well, the same thing happens with certain kind of prayer. There's recoil that if you don't know what you're doing, and you're doing it for the wrong reason, and you don't have clarity in, in, on why you're using it, there's a whole lot of, re even if you do have clarity, there's still a certain amount of recoil on using certain things. So that's the thing, I'm saying this for people that are out there, because people want to like, I want to get this, and I want to get that, and I want this, that, and the other. They get all that stuff, and, and, it, and, if, and if what I say flips on them, and then that can cause people to have psychological breakdowns and and they can bring trouble on themselves because they shouldn't, sometimes you shouldn't even have certain things. You shouldn't even have it in your possession. That's what I would say about all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to discuss this with you because I have heard you bring this up, this, these sorts of themes up briefly in other contexts. So it's nice to be able to, to talk a bit in a bit more detail about it, actually. Well, uh, I appreciate being able to talk about it. I normally have never really talked about this on a public forum, but, um, you know, I'm talking about it and, you know, I'm trying to say it in, in a respect that ultimately it's about the four immeasurables. We want to have peace and love towards people. You know what I'm saying? All this other kind of stuff is basically used to keep the peace, you know, but unfortunately, if a person's not trying to deal with the basics, the basics are most important, the shamatha. The Vispassana, you know, un understanding that, and then going through Nundro, and then going through, uh, uh, especially in our system of Tibetan Buddhism, and going through the uh, Guru Yogas and all the different stages with the teacher is very, very important. All this other kind of stuff is only if you called to do that, and only if you meant to do that. You know what I'm saying? It's not something like, oh, I want to do this because it seems so interesting, it seems cool, and all that. That can, that can cause a, a serious problem. I only do these things because my life is, and what's happened in my life has dictated the fact that I had to do these things, not because that was my uh, uh, life goal or, or my life mission, because it definitely wasn't. When I, as I've mentioned to you before, this happened like this and this is fine, but it wasn't like I grew up saying, this is what I want to do, or gee, this is cool, and all that kind of stuff. That had none of, that definitely wasn't the case. Yeah, well, Dr. Shakur, this has been so interesting. We didn't even really touch on your work as a police chaplain, and that's a whole other chapter because there are themes there that perhaps we should do a third one, a third uh, interview. There are themes there to do with experiencing and witnessing so much suffering and violence and crime and perhaps even, as you put it, evil. And uh, I think there's a lot there to talk about. So perhaps if you're willing, we could do another episode some point in the future, uh, specifically I about your work as a chaplain. I wouldn't mind doing a third one. We had a gentleman, which his name escapes me, that was uh, uh, talked about chaplaincy, and I was very touched by that. But being a police chaplain and transform was probably <clears throat> the most transformative aspect of my life. Probably losing my son was one, and shortly uh, that happened shortly after I had resigned from the police department. And in eight years as a police chaplain, I've seen things that I even have to reflect upon now and, and still do work about now still work on now because I, I've seen some devastating things and um, yes I would like to talk about that um, uh, at, at, at a future um, at, at a future interview great well I look forward to it Dr. K.A. Shakur thank you very much oh uh, you're very welcome thank you thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast 
For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.